there are a couple chapters in this week in this week's assignments that really do warrant specific attention uh, in our lessons for the week. So uh, this is a particular lecture on chapter three in the Cornoyer Cor <laughs> workbook uh, on critical thinking and scientific inquiry. Now, we're going to be talking about these topics throughout the semester. And as I believe I mentioned earlier, this is not a research class. And many of the details involved in it, when we start talking about scientific processes, I'm going to defer uh, any kind of lengthy explanations uh, for a couple of different reasons, one of which is that well, this is not what the purpose of this course is. And secondly, the, the, um, your, your education is going to include a very thorough, uh, very thorough education on research methods with someone who is very highly skilled and schooled in, in those methods, much more than I. And so I don't want to pollute your learning with, uh, with uh, incorrect statements. And so what, what I'm going to give you is really my understanding and hopefully it's accurate understanding of these things. So um, social workers, you know, in general, must possess an extraordinary breadth and depth of knowledge. We have to have access to even more knowledge and to be able to understand and analyze just a massive amount of emerging information so that we can provide effective, up-to-date services to our clients who oftentimes are facing very, very difficult challenges. In order to accomplish this, we need to really have some highly developed critical thinking skills. And we need to understand enough so that we can engage in some level of scientific inquiry and also um, can be driven to continue to learn throughout our careers. Critical thinking involves the propensity and the skill to use reflective skepticism. That's a great term, reflective skepticism when engaged in specific activities. Critical thinking means we don't accept information at, at face value, that we carefully examine and evaluate beliefs and actions for logic and accuracy. Scientific inquiry involves making observations, posing questions, examining books and other sources of information to see what is already known, planning investigations, reviewing what is already known in light of experimental evidence, using different kinds of tools to gather, analyze, and interpret data, prepare answers and explanations and predictions, and communicating the results of all of that to our clients and to others. So we have to be able to identify our assumptions and make use of critical and logical thinking and consider alternative explanations uh, as we go about the process of, of working with our clients. And the two, this is critical thinking and scientific inquiry, uh, really are inseparable when it comes to professional evidence-based social work practice. There are certain specific inquiry skills that a social worker has to have in order to uh, proceed with uh, a good a good uh, assessment of different approaches and methods and here are some of those skills uh, being able to ask the right kinds of questions to define the problem uh, how to go about understanding how to analyze and interpret the data um, coming up with an explanation and that kind of thing you know engaging in an argument when we have evidence uh, that supports those arguments those kind of, that all that kind of stuff is a part of the skills we have to have in order to proceed with scientific inquiry in, in um, considering the value of information there are certain things that critical thinkers tend to be particularly adept at, and here are some of those those skills: being able to identify verifiable facts and value and value statements, and be able to distinguish between the two. And and that's a that's an important thing, particularly in in this day and age when uh, so much you know with this sort of the era of fake news and 
uh, social media presentations of of different perceptions and perspectives and while a lot of that tends to be very political in nature nonetheless having the capacity to be able to sort through what we're seeing even in that arena is something that's very helpful to us it's even more critical when it comes to our our professional skills and in, in being able to do that as well how do we distinguish facts uh, information claims that are relevant versus those that are irrelevant and, and how can we determine the accuracy of a statement do uh, you know for instance you know a lot of people rely upon some of those fact checking organizations and other people insist that those fact checking organizations have their own biases and and that we need to be aware of um, we have to be able to discover things like ambiguous statement statements and and also explore uh, unstated assumptions when it comes to you know certain kinds of studies and things like that a bias that might be involved in the study identifying logical fallacies and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes um, and all these kinds of things in order to determine the overall strength of uh, of a particular claim um, Paul and Elder describe six stages of critical thinking development uh, and 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 how they how we move through our ability to think critically the unreflective stage where we really lack awareness of thinking problems we become challenged we're aware of thinking problems but really don't do anything to improve them in the beginning phase there are periodic attempts to improve our thinking quality when we're in the practicing stage we make regular efforts to improve the quality of our thinking in the advanced stage we have made noticeable improvements as efforts to do so become more systematic and in accomplished you know skillful thinking is sort of second nature we don't even have to think about thinking about something critically we just kind of do that more or less automatically uh, that that uh, really does involve a higher level of skill and a lot of years of practice and I, I guess I I would think I would probably put myself at the practicing stage of critical thinking, although I'd like to think that I'm at, at an advanced stage. But uh, well, well, you know, time will tell, I suppose, as to whether or not I've actually reached that. But it's worth kind of considering where where we stand in, in terms of being able to think critically about about things, about issues in front of us. The the uh, model of intellectual development. This comes from a uh, Perry and and um, some of the similarities uh, that uh, I think that uh, that exist in Paul and Elder's critical thinking stages are are fairly obvious. Perry suggests that during the educational experience, college students tend to adopt positions within four categories of intellectual development, and dualistic thinkers uh, often assume that the that there's an absolute truth out there somewhere in the universe, and and that there's a valid source for for that knowledge. And someone has extraordinary access to a specific understanding of that valid source. So this is where I think we we tend to think that there are experts who know the right thing. Uh, multi multiplistic thinkers often make claims based upon an assumption that perspectives cannot cannot make and perhaps should not be judged by others or by external standards there's no right or wrong in this particular in this particular way of seeing things and everyone has a right to his or her own opinions contextually relativistic thinkers uh, see different points of view or frames of reference um, that that uh, vary in terms of their value or utility according to the situation or to the circumstance contextual relativism and a committed relativistic thinker adopts a general philosophy with a set of values or guiding principles um, that involve an approach to life and considers um, various points of view personal values guide those decision makings these these values tend to be almost transcendent transcendent a certain, to a certain extent human rights social justice to particular ideas or positions uh, and and that um, with these kinds of things, committed thinkers can prioritize and make decisions and take action based upon uh, based upon those values. So again, another way for us perhaps to to assess our own development in terms of uh, or at least how we approach things intellectually. 
Now, a logical fallacy is an argument that's usually psychologically persuasive, but it's also logically weak. These uh, commonly appear in, in uh, everyday exchanges of, of ideas in, in, pl in places like, you know, journal articles, even journal articles that we, we lean on heavily and call, call them professional, but also uh, more commonly um, access materials like newspaper editorials, letter to the editor, political speeches, advertisements, uh, in arguments between people, those kinds of things. They're, they're based on a pseudoscience and tend to uh, be focused upon convincing people who don't really reflect about what they're seeing. And again, you know, I think the social media is, is uh, these days uh, and the information that we get through the media, not only in social media, but in many different aspects, tend to be uh, logical fallacies. <clears throat> Those uh, people who, uh, you know, who study the field of logic and communication have, have all sorts of uh, informal logical fallacies that they've been able to develop. And some of the common ones here, like confirmation bias, where, you know, we go into uh, uh, an investigation already convinced that we know the, what the outcome is going to be. And, and this is often the case. This is often the case, for instance, in, in child protection uh, studies I've, or uh, investigations, I've seen this time and again, where workers will go out pretty much already convinced of the validity of an allegation, perhaps because, you know, we, we've met the family previously. And to be able to go into a situation like that and to really consider things with an open mind is, is often um, really quite difficult, <clears throat> quite difficult attribution biases and and the ultimate attribution error you know where we blame the individual for a situation that they're in instead of looking at you know the uh, the circumstances that that are contributing or causing the particular uh, issues ad hominem attacks you know where instead of focusing upon the argument you focus on the person making the argument um, m making use of anecdotal evidence and this is another thing that we tend to do an awful lot of in our work because it's what we know and I know I use that a lot and you'll probably hear me talk about anecdotes that, that uh, you know that that I use to support some of the things that I'm saying and from a scientific standpoint it's not supportable really it's not it's not a good strong uh, at least uh, ev amount of uh, type of evidence there are in in scientific studies you know even when you look at scientific studies sci uh, studies uh, can be samples rather can be biased uh, according to the population you know or the way it was set up or the way the question is worded those kinds of things um, sometimes we use personal experience or popular beliefs or you know we use a practice because this is the thing that's usually used that we, we tend to popular practice we tend to uh, go ahead and make use of things that we've done before or other people use those kinds of things so there's lots of logical fallacies in our thinking that we need to guard against these represent genuine threats to the quality and validity of conclusions in in our practice and in our research uh, and and um, have a way to um, well, to decrease the likelihood of credible results in any of our research. Scientific researchers attempt to control for uh, the threats to internal and external validity and to reduce the probability of false positives and false negatives while increasing the likelihood of true positives and true negatives. Now, I, I didn't put the, the little slide up about there, there is a there is a matrix in the in the book about this, uh, you know, so that when someone holds a belief um, or proposes a hypothesis that something is true and it actually is true or valid, that's called a true positive. When somebody believes or hypothesizes something that is false or invalid, and it actually is false or invalid, it's called a true negative. But a false positive occurs when someone asserts that something is true or valid. But when it's actually false or invalid and a false negative occurs when somebody says something is false or invalid when in fact it's actually true or valid and so again you know these these kinds of um, things can happen in, in scientific studies and and so um, researchers should be trying to find ways to control for these kinds of things and and that's one of the things that perhaps we should look at when we uh, when we're when we're selecting studies in our research 
So a scientific inquiry, um, the, the purpose of the scientific inquiry is to search and locate practice-related research studies, analyze them for their quality and their relevance, and translate credible findings for use in professional activities. We have to uh, think critically and scientifically about all the hypotheses and judgments and actions that we run into uh, in order to guard against uh, you know, false negatives or false positives and to increase the true negatives and true positives in our, in our thinking. You know, though some social workers conduct um, large-scale scientific research studies on a full-time basis, most of us use skills of scientific inquiry for two main purposes, and that is to search for and locate practice-related research studies and, and, to, and then to analyze them for their quality um, and to translate those findings for professional activities or to evaluate the effectiveness of the service we're providing for our clients. Step, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So here, steps in the evidence-based process. Uh, this is a, just a kind of a chart that's, again, from the text that uh, tells you a little bit about the, the five steps that, according to Cournoyer's model, at least, in terms of how we go about evidence-based practice looking for uh, research-based evidence that addresses the question that we've posed and and uh, trying to select the, in concert with the client, uh, selecting the best approach and then evaluating it eventually and seeing how it turned out. And there are, uh, by the way, some organizations available on the web that uh, are, uh, are mentioned in this textbook and also Gambrel refers, <coughs> refers to them in different por uh, points when she talks about evidence-based practice later in our studies. The, the, these uh, organizations uh, analyze scientific studies and uh, review research literature and it's my understanding that you can access these organizations on the web by the way so that you know you can look for uh, uh, studies that are have been really kind of taken apart pretty closely and um, might be able to rely upon the results of you know or the the conclusions reached on these websites Now, validity is one of those things that we have to look at in terms of uh, the credibility of the questions that we posed. And there are, there are different kinds of, of validity in scientific research. Uh, construct validity is the strength of the relationship between the way the phenomenon under investigation is conceived and measured and the actual phenomena itself. It, it is, is how we're going about, I mean, um, how we conceive the problem actually related to the problem. That's construct validity. Conclusion validity refers to the strength of a relationship of some kind, causal or not, between the acti activity under investigation and the outcome. And then there are two other types of validity that are especially relevant for us. The internal validity refers to the research design's capacity to uh, determine if an independent variable caused change in the dependent variable, that it really, you know, was the connection really there. And external validity refers to the, 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 the research design's capacity to permit findings that can be generalized or externalized to a larger population. So internal validity, you know, is, is within the study itself. Is there a connection uh, between the independent and dependent variable that really shows there is a connection there? And external is, can we, can we actually use this and generalize it to a larger population? There are different kinds of threats to, to uh, internal and external validity um, it, when we conduct scientific research or others do and this is just some of them again confirmation bias and how we select participants and you know um, reactivity uh, repeated testing effects all uh, the ambiguity of causes all those kinds of things and and again I um, well going into these in great detail is is really beyond the the uh, the scope of this of this particular class Cornoyer Cor uh, does talk about these some and and uh, I'd encourage you to kind of take a look at that more closely in your reading. Uh, 
there are different kinds of ways that uh, studies are classified at different different ways of looking at it and uh, here's a couple of different models Nathan and Gorman uh, classify studies uh, from type 1 to type 6 where type 1 studies are these very thorough randomized um, prospective clinical trials that involve comparison groups with random assignments and blind assessments um, a presentation of exclusion and inclusion criteria, state-of-the-art diagnostic methods, uh, a good sample size, clearly described statistical methods. I mean a really thorough, um, very scientific study. To type 6 studies, uh, which really have probably marginal value from a scientific standpoint, and things like case studies, essays, opinion papers, you know, the kinds of things things we tend to rely upon more in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, in, in our professional journals, a lot of times the peer-reviewed studies, I think you'll find, are probably closer to type 6 than type 1. Um, Guy at Sackett in Sinclair, uh, they have another way of, of uh, classifying uh, scientific or rather research designs and Probably again very close, very similar to what we looked at here with the type one to type six. These are seven levels, and and you can see there that uh, the the preference in terms of I think from scientific validity and and those kinds of things you can kind of see from top to bottom that they the lower the level or I guess level one is the higher level I don't know would would be the most scientific and uh, level seven would be the least which really case reports are very anecdotal in nature, right? Now, one, one limitation of these classifications that Cornoyer points out is, is that they really don't give much, uh, much credence to single system design research, which is something that we tend to rely upon pretty heavily in our work. You know, where you, you sit down with a client and you, you provide an assessment at the beginning of treatment and you maybe provide the same assessment at varying intervals during treatment or at the end of treatment and you, and you chart or map um, change in whatever the particular thing you're treating may be or may not be occurring. So you're testing out, you know, the usefulness of your intervention that way, single subject design, uh, meaning just that person. And, and uh, that, you know, there are those who say that single subject design, and we were, I was trained in single subject design research uh, uh, in my master's training at Florida State, in fact, uh, had a guy who was kind of one of the experts of that and it had actually had developed some, some, um, uh, uh, valid and reliable um, uh, ways of going about measuring things like self-esteem and depression and those kinds of things. Uh, name, his name was Walter Hudson, but in any event, he um, he was he was a big one on single system design, and, and it, it's very helpful sometimes in just being able to determine how things are going in your work with your client. Now, these neither of these two studies or these two classifications really, I think, give. Um, give much credence to these so for what that's worth going back to uh, let's see gosh Paul and Elder um, they uh, we, we talked about them a little while ago and uh, in in looking at something earlier in our studies and anyway they they have uh, um, an array of intellectual virtues or standards that might help us uh, engage in critical thinking and and lifelong learning and and these are virtuous traits and they're polar opposites so they call, refer to them as intellectual virtues and and I guess you know you can kind of look at these one by one as well you know intellectual confidence and reason versus intellectual distrust of reason fair-mindedness intellectual fair-mindedness versus, versus intellectual unfairness integrity versus hypocrisy, you know, on down the list. So that, again, other ways of kind of looking at our intellectual tendencies and, and how we go about examining things. Um, so that, uh, you know, they really apply to the way that we think and learn and, and speak and write about things like practice and policy and professional issues, and maybe even the way we live our lives.
Now, when we're looking for um, research studies, you know, there's there are different kinds of articles, and there are authority-based articles that reflect the opinions and suggestions of people who have some amount of expertise in relation to this topic. And I think we were talking early on here about, uh, you know, being cautious about using authority as the basis for our decision making, because sometimes authority is overrated, perhaps, you know, being in a position of authority intellectually or administratively does not necessarily mean that 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 is also connected to the truth. Research based articles contain terms and language that aren't easily understood by the general public uh, and sometimes even by us. And so there are other, those are other, also kinds of articles that, uh, you know, we can use, but may also have some uh, drawbacks to their use. But we should be able to review and evaluate research studies that relate to our, our profession's mission uh, to a particular area that in which we practice, whether it be child welfare or substance abuse or, you know, school social work or, you know, geriatrics, whatever it might be, um, that relate to the social problems that, that we address in our work, you know, that we, that we understand uh, what, uh, be able to find research about the problems and evaluate that research and, and about the clients that we serve. So, and, and this is a kind of a given, I think, the conclusions of studies achieve increased credibility if they can be replicated from study to study. The more we see this repeated, the more we can have confidence in it. In teaching sociology, we used to talk about the concept of tentative truth, which is that a study will tell us, you know, the outcome of a study tells us that something is true and that perhaps in, in social sciences at least remains true until another, another study comes along and disputes that truth, comes up with a different finding. And that's that's why, you know, I think in almost every finding, every research, every study that you run into and that we run into in our field, you know, we should consider it tentative truth because there may be something come along that, that totally disputes and changes our thinking. and. What we knew, and um, you know, when I went to school uh, 30, 40 years ago, whatever, whenever it was, you know, it's very different from what we know. In I use that in quotes today. Now, when you're looking at research studies, this is generally the the structure of how a research article is put up. You know, and and uh, you've you've seen them already. So, they, sometimes, uh, uh, well. You know, we have a tendency sometimes to read the abstract and the introduction. And um, if we're in a hurry, a lot of times we might skip over the method analysis and go right to the findings and the discussion, skip over the references and those kinds of things. And that's not exactly the way to go about it if you're going to really be looking at evidence-based practice. First of all, you know, you determine the purpose of reading the article. Why are we even looking at this? So we have a client with a particular problem uh, and we believe the problem is X and we want to we want to uh, research uh, or look for studies that um, that talk about the different approaches to dealing with X, let's say. And so the way the Cornoyer rec recommends um, going about uh, a research or evaluating a research study is to have a first reading and 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 really here what you see is you're kind of you you know you're looking closely well that's kind of what I would just get done saying we we typically tend to do which is to read the uh, you know read the the beginning sections uh, scan over the middle read the summary and and uh, see if the conclusions are really useful to us or not maybe look over the references a little bit but that's just the first pass through the article if you're going to do this right. If we do the second, uh, if, we, if we're going to really do this thoroughly, we go through a second reading where each section is read more carefully. We classify the research approach. We, des we, we uh, make a decision as to whether the design could be valid and reliable and, and to give us answers that are relevant to whatever our research question or to that research question what it was. In other words, we're really evaluating the study itself. Uh, looking at internal and external validity and trying to use some of those, look for some of those threats to those validity, such as confirmation bias and, you know, those kind of attribution errors, those, are, those types of things. 
look at who the participants were in the study. Are they, are they at all connected to our client group? And, you know, the groups that our clients belong to, or are they kind of irrelevant to our client's life? Um, we consider the charts and tables and figures and diagrams and and look at them as opposed to the narrative and 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 um, also because studies often have uh, participants who drop out and they should they should talk about that and how those dropouts were addressed were they included in the, the study's conclusions or not and anybody look at why they were leaving those kinds of things then we then we annotate so that we prepare a summary annotation for entry into some sort of reference database that we're going to keep and share hopefully with others. And to be concise with this, avoid duplication and organize the relevant information under the headings uh, that, are, that are given here. Um, the and, and here I'm just looking, you know, at, at what what the author says about the social workers' notes about the research study. Uh, he actually has this expanded, so that it's the types of research study, key terms and concepts, characteristics and number of participants in the study, the participant selection process. Re this is all the social workers' notes. Okay, the research questions or hypotheses. What measures were used? What threats did you find to internal and external validity? Uh, what were the results of, you know, a brief summary of that? Statistical findings, strengths and weaknesses of the study, and quoting some passages and, and the page numbers associated with them. Now, this is where, this is how you go about a really thorough examination of, 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 of um, you know, research and, and the scientific inquiry, let's say, and a question about our clients. And um, this is where I, I talk about the fact that this is something that's very difficult to implement when you're carrying a regular size caseload, which is usually too much, too big to even keep up with your contacts sometimes with clients. But this is how we go about it if we're going to do it right. Don't be discouraged. So we have to understand statistical processes and analysis. And, and there's, this is a concept that's something relatively new to me, you know, about statistical power. It's the probability that a particular statistical procedure will correctly detect a difference in a sample when such a difference actually exists in a larger population. In other words, is this going to, is this going to, um, that, that actually, that slide should say, when such a difference actually exists in a larger population. I'm just going to go ahead and do this right now, just right in front of you once again, so I don't forget this. Such a difference exists in a larger population. Um, power analysis are conducted to determine what the right sample size is. So we want to decrease the amount of false findings. So. If social workers neglect these kinds of analysis, they, they uh, we're told that we run the risk of reporting erroneous results because the sample size is too small or maybe even too big. Statistical procedures might occasionally be used in an improper manner so that any of the findings could be reasonably questioned. And so, uh, for instance, Uh, let me see here, move on to the next slide. Effect size statistics, ES statistics, reveal the amount of difference and the direction of that difference between two groups. These are, uh, well, the, this is a part of what they call the new statistics in, 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 the, in, in this particular textbook. and. Um, there are there are different kinds of or types of effects size statistic analyses, and, and um, some of these you're going to hear referred to in the Gambrel text, for instance. You know the number needed to treat, uh, relative risk, those kinds of things. Um, I don't. Uh, I had something set aside about the the number needed to treat, and I lost the reference, but. Again, this is something we'll be looking at later in the semester, and I know you're going to be studying more in in um, in uh, your your research class. But this is just the kind of thing that tells you there's a lot to consider when, when we, 
when we're pursuing evidence-based practice. The key characteristics of a systematic review are shown here. So that there's a clearly stated set of objectives with predefined eligibility criteria for studies. It has an explicit reproducible methodology. It has a systematic um, search process that attempts to identify all the studies that would meet the eligibility criteria. It is an assessment of the validity of the findings of the included studies through the assessment of risk of bias and a systematic presentation and synthesis of the characteristics and findings of the included studies. So this uh, systematic review that you're conducting to try to find the proper intervention or the, or, you know, whatever it might be with our client, um, this is the kind of review that you're going to put together in the end of that, of that review. Now there's also a, a meta-analysis, which is a, a, is a process of, of, of a research that involves using statistical methods to combine the results of individual studies, kind of an overview of, you know, an analysis of analyses. That's why it's a meta-analysis. Uh, so this, this uh, can be used to calculate effect sizes and uh, incorporates a lot of weighting processes that determine the cre credibility of, of certain kinds of studies. Again, I refer you to your research professor for this. But not to make light of the need to do this because, you know, knowledge, truly, knowledge is expanding and changing at a speed we've never known before in human history. Way back when, there was a book written by an author by the name of Alvin Toffler. The book was called Future Shock. It was, I think it was published in the late 60s and you know if you know your american history you know that was a time of great social upheaval and all those kinds of things everybody was kind of questioning what we were doing with the world it was the opening the beginning of the environmental movement during that period of time the hippie movement was strong there's a lot of political unrest etc 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 and and uh, one of the things we were doing was exploring the social condition and computers were you know the computer chip had been invented by that time and and uh, although computers were as large as buildings perhaps still at the time um, nonetheless it was clear that the computer was going to become a major a major force in our lives it was the beginning of the information age and and Toffler's book really kind of looked at all these changes and he said you know one of the things about human beings is, is that the, the way we have coped through the through the eons or through the generations to generations is that as change occurs and as we've had to occur just our, our species had survived because we adapted to the changes and and um, you know our life was improving because of that but with the advent of the computer and 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 uh, that kind of of a device our change was beginning to occur so rapidly that the human being the, the the human animal might not be able to keep pace with the change they may not be able to change as rapidly as the change is going to occur and I think you know I think we've seen that I, I talk about social media I saw a little meme on Facebook that said imagine it's 1950 and uh, how are you going to explain uh, you know your cell phone to to somebody in 1950 you know that you put a a computer in your pocket and you know you can use it to look up information on the internet and, or pictures of cats or whatever you want to do with it i mean you know what well, first of all what's a computer you know and, and the telephone is something that's corded and don't, maybe not not even have a dial yet you know it might be somewhere you talk to the operator you know the change has just been so dramatic and and uh, toffler's theory was is that because we were going to have difficulty adapting to the rapidity of that stress you know that we were going to wind up with a lot of psychiatric and psychological problems and th there may be some truth to that there may be actually a lot of truth to that i i keep telling myself i want to go back and read that book again and see how prophetic it was but i have a feeling that it was quite prophetic and so just along those lines that's a bit of a digression but you know what we considered true 10 years ago is is known now to be false or at least is not true necessarily that's that tentative truth i was referring to and 
accepted truths rapidly become obsolete as we find through more and more research um, that uh, well they're they're obsolete that we have more we have new information and our knowledge base is expanded and things and so what what i'm saying here is is that we need to continually and as the author says aggressively pursue additional learning and and to analyze the information that we get there is an ethical obligation uh, to improve our knowledge and skills throughout our careers and we do that through training and those kinds of things but our own independent research is something that could be some of the most important things that we do and there's a three-step process that the uh, the author suggests uh, uh, for for pursuing lifelong learning that is to specify your learning goal to develop and implement a learning plan based you know to achieve that goal and to evaluate and document your progress towards towards achieving that goal and I lost my last slide I don't know where it went but uh, it, it was uh, the, the last slide was where is it for heaven's sakes I don't know where it went to but but uh, it, it this involved in, in in documenting learning that when we've once we've implemented our plan so we make progress towards the learning goals uh, we should store the materials that are relevant to that to that uh, research and especially the, the final products in in sort of a a lifelong learning pro portfolio of sort whether you have this in paper or digital form um, this the kind of documentation really can serve lots of purposes for instance you know it gives you an opportunity to have things at your fingertips that you can review to refresh your memory about something that you learned before uh, you can use the that particular document as a, a launching point for more learning in the same or similar area you know to advance that knowledge more you can uh, distribute those documents to your colleagues or or to people who are making policies in your agencies or agencies that are serving your clients to advance their own learning and maybe raise their consciousness some um, and and you know also when you go to uh, interview for employment I mean you can share some of this information with your prospective employer it can't hurt you if you're trying to get hired for something to have this kind of stuff at your fingertips so anyway that's sort of what the last slide would be I'm gonna see if I can find that slide before I publish this the PDF for the uh, um, for for the blackboard course but uh, in any event that's that's it for chapter three and I hope that this was useful to you uh, again I know I'm skimming the surface on on research techniques and and those kinds of things because you're gonna have a much much better presentation and more thorough instruction in this before too long Okay, that's it for chapter three. Don't go away because there'll be more to more to listen to.